Hi everyone, I'm Bia, and welcome back to Cardiac Radio for Teens. For those of you who don't know, Cardiac Radio for Teens is a place where teens can come together with other teens to learn about spiritist teachings and topics in a way that makes more sense to us and is more relatable to us as teenagers in today's society. We read through the Spirits book together completely, and then we started uh, reading through the Gospel according to Spiritism, and uh, we're currently in Chapter 7, where last week we started talking about this chapter, which are blessed are the poor in spirit. And a lot of confusion came with these words by Jesus, blessed are the poor in spirit, because some people think it means, oh, blessed are the ones who are not intelligent, right? Or the ones who are poor physically. Um, but it's not talking about that. It's talking about those who are humble, right? Those who are not selfish um, and who are humble and trying to do their best. And the key word there is those who are humble. And last week, we started reading some little stories that Jesus told to kind of explain this, um, to kind of explain these concepts. So one story, if we remember from last week, was that there was the spot at the head of the table, right? If we go into the room and we assume that we're the most important person there and sit at the head of the table... When we're not the most important person and someone asks us to move from that head of the table, we'll feel embarrassed and upset. Instead, being humble is, you may be okay, you might be the most important person in the room, but you don't assume that, right? Because you're not selfish, you're not only thinking about yourself, so you don't assume that, so you just sit in any spot of the table, and then if they're like, oh no, the head of the table's for you, then that's an honor for you to move up to that, right? And you feel um, grateful for that opportunity. So it's the difference of the outcome, right? And again, this all only has to do with seats at a table, but just these little scenarios show us the difference between being humble or, or not, right? If we sit ourselves with everyone else and then we move up, it'll be a great honor. But if we say, oh, I'm the most important, so I sit at the head of the table, and then someone more important comes and they ask me to move, then you're just going to feel embarrassed and upset about that situation instead of the other way around. So we'll continue at um, section 6 of the section, He who exalts himself shall be humbled. These maxims stem from the principle of humility that Jesus was constantly presenting as an essential condition for the happiness promised to the chosen of the Lord, which he presents in this manner. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He took a child as a symbol of simplicity of heart when he said, The greatest in the kingdom of heaven will be those who are humble and small as a little child. That is to say, who hold no pretension to superiority or infallibility. So, so Jesus says, so this comes down to Jesus was always stressing being humble, right? And that's what they're saying here. And they're saying, the way he said it was, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? So blessed are those who are um, humble and who aren't arrogant and selfish and showing themselves off. And he used the example of a child, right? Because a child is not thinking that they're better than the adults around them or anyone that's older than them, right? They always look up and obey those who are older than them. So it's it's saying like that, be like, be humble and be like the small child, right? That you're not, to understand that you're not the best and be okay. And even if you are doing great things, that doesn't mean there are people that are better than you that have have a different responsibility than you. And just being, coming to terms with that. And again, it's important to remember that we can't fake these things because God sees right through that. So if we're saying, okay, I'm going to pretend to be humble right now to get some brownie points or whatever it is, that's not going to work because in the long run, God sees right through that. God knows when we're pretending or when we're being genuine. So that's something we all really have to work on because we're not perfect yet. So we have these moments of um, not being humble and of being jealous and all these other things so we need to work on that ourselves and that's how we can apply this to our daily lives we find the same fundamental idea in the following maxim whoever wants to be first must be your slave and also in this he who humbles himself himself will be exalted 
and he who exalts himself will be humbled. So again, with the same situation as the table, right? He who humbles himself, right? So puts yourself with everyone else, he will be exalted. Like he'll be um, almost like praised, put higher up. But he who exalts himself, like he who's praising himself and saying, oh, I'm the best, will be humbled, right? You're going to have to be humbled and you're going to have to go back and that's going to be a rude awakening. So we want to go from, right, from us being humble to them being exalted and not vice versa. And also the other said, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, right? So being first in the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean being rich or powerful or anything in this material world, right? It's about being humble, doing your best. And even if that is, if you have to serve someone else, if you have to be under someone else, do your best. And even if you are the top, don't let that get to your head, right? Stay humble even if you've earned your way to that top position. Spiritism confirms its theories through examples when it shows us that those who are great in the spiritual world are those who were small on earth. That frequently those who were great and powerful on earth find themselves extremely small in the spirit world. This is because on dying, man takes with him only that which makes for greatness in heaven, that which is never lost, which are his virtues. All earthly greatnesses, such as riches, titles, glory, nobleness of birth, etc., are impossible to take. On reaching the other side, if man has not has nothing apart from these qualities, he finds himself destitute of everything, as a person who is shipwrecked loses everything, even to his clothes. Then, the only item still retained is pride, which makes the position even worse more humiliating when it is found that those they throd underfoot on earth have been raised to places of glory far above. Right? So here they're saying that when we die from this corporal body, the only things that are going to count for us are the good things that we've done, right? Um, the virtues that we have, the things, the great things that we've done while being humble. But then the opposite also happens to people who are not humble, right? So they have only worried about riches, titles, glory, all these material things, when they get to the spirit world, they're not going to have anything that's still with them, right? None of those things are going to follow them. So what's left? Nothing, right? And how they thought they were so great and powerful was just a little, like, a little piece in time in, on this earthly life, but that's not going to count for anything. And above that, they're going to be so proud of, oh, but I was a king, oh, I did this and this and this, But that's not the point, right? Not what title we had, but what good we were doing. So that's what they say. We see that the the people that are great in the spirit world are often small on earth, right? Like, not short, but small in power, right? And maybe, maybe just one of those people in the background that you don't even notice that they're always doing good, they're always smiling, but you never see them doing anything crazy. You never hear much about them. But meanwhile, those people that are at the top that you hear so much about, they end up at the bottom in the spirit world they end up um as one of those small people right and for them it's a lot harder right to to go from having all this power and all this greatness to going down to nothing so we just want to make sure that we're keeping ourselves aware of this and trying to stay humble because it's much better to get to the spirit world and they'll say wow you did a great job and then we'll be praised right and then we'll we'll know that we did something good then thinking we're being the best now and then going to spirit world and figuring out that's not true at all. Spiritism also shows another side of this principle. Within the process of successive reincarnations, when those who is one, those who in one life have raised themselves to high positions are then born into lowly conditions in a succeeding existence if they have allowed themselves to be dominated by pride and ambition. Therefore, Do not seek the highest position on earth, nor place yourself among others if you do not wish to be obliged to descend. On the contrary, seek the most humble and modest positions, seeing that God will then give you more elevated place in heaven if you deserve it. So, again, here they're saying that 
we also see this between different reincarnations, right? So when someone tries to raise themselves to the highest positions, to be the greatest, the power, the most powerful, they're going to reincarnate into a position that's much lower, um, much lower and doesn't have any, um, doesn't have anything to it that they used to think was important, right? Doesn't have any riches, doesn't have any glory, doesn't have any titles because they're going to have to learn from this, right? They're going to have to dominate their pride and their, um, and this ambition that they have. So they're saying, don't, you don't have to seek that highest position, right? You don't have to try and go for the highest position as long as you're doing the right thing, right? Following a good path, being humble and all of that. It's okay if you do end up working to a higher position um, by working hard and doing things truthfully, but not letting that pride and selfishness get to us. So sometimes on earth, even though we want to get to the highest position, which is not the, the problem, it's the way we handle that, um, that highest position. So we can seek the most humble and modest positions, right? As long as we're doing the right thing, we'll deserve it. But that also doesn't mean that, oh, okay, I just want a good place in the kingdom of heaven, so I'm just gonna have um, a low level job and just live like that. No, we also have to be doing that humbly and still following that good path and having a, um, the right attitude towards it, right? So it's not just about being in those modest positions, but also, like they said here, deserving, um, deserving that merit at the end for what we've done. So now we're onto the next section, which is mysteries are hidden from the learned and prudent. At the time, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to, to little children. Matthew eleven twenty five. It may appear quite singular that Jesus gives thanks to God for having revealed these things to the simple and humble who are the poor in spirit and for having hidden them from the learned and prudent, who apparently are more able to understand. But we, re we must recognize that the former are those who are submissive, who humble themselves before God, and do not consider themselves per superior. The latter are those who are arrogant and full of pride, for their worldly knowledge, judging themselves prudently, because they deny God or who, when they are not refusing to accept him, treat him as an equal, despite the fact that in ancient times, learned was a synonym for wise. This is why God has left them to discover the secrets of the earth and reveal the secrets of heaven only to the humble who bow down before him. So here they're explaining this quote that's from Jesus, right? That he's thanking God for hitting the things from the wise and the learned and revealing them to little t children, right? Which again, doesn't mean that, um, so he's comparing these, the wise and the learned to the people who have this great power, who are, who are really selfish, right? And thinking about themselves and reveal them to the little children as the people who are humble and who, um, and who are following that path of good that we're talking, that we're always talking about. So, it doesn't mean that these people act like little children, like they're uneducated. It's not that. It's that they they follow God and they understand their place um, in the hierarchy, right? They understand that they're not at the top. They understand that God's at the top and they, they, um, they follow God. And they know and they humbly, like they say, they humbly bow down to, to him. So that's the important characteristic of these little children. And for the people who are wise and learned, it's more about the people who pretend that they're wise, right? The people who are arrogant and full of pride, but that at the top, they think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm wise, I'm learned, I'm the best one here, right? And those things, but for those people, they're, um, the, they're things hidden from them, right? And not hidden from them on purpose, but they are not doing the right things to be able to understand those things so maybe those people at the top refuse to believe in god because they don't want someone that's more powerful than them 
And so in which case, it's not that God's hiding it from them, God's hiding these lessons and teachings from them, but they're blocking themselves out, right? They're shielding themselves from that. While the children is soaking in all the information that it's receiving from around it, right? It's learning, it's um, following God's path, it's understanding that people are above it and being fine with that um, and humbling themselves, right? So that's the important difference. It's just a way that he worded it, but it doesn't mean that the children, these children, quote unquote, are not wise, right? They are wise, but um, it's just not those arrogant and full of pride people that believe they are wise. The same thing has happened today with the great truths revealed by Spiritism. Many of those who are incredulous are surprised by the fact that the spirits take so little trouble to convince them. The reason for this being that it is preferable to look after those who seek with good faith and humili humility rather than offering enlightenment to those who suppose they already possess it, who perhaps imagine that God should be very thankful for having managed to attract their attention by proving his existence to them. So here they're talking about now their, that relation to even spiritism now and saying that many people think that like, oh, spiritism's not really trying to convince me of these things. And the reason is it's preferable to, to look for those who are of good faith and who are humble, right? Who are not going to... Spiritism isn't trying to convince you of anything, but if you read it and you understand it and you process it, and like you said, like if they have good faith and humility, then you'll follow along with spiritism. Like they said, you'll be convinced, quote-unquote, but some people think they're too good, like, oh, why aren't you trying to convince me, like, um, and all of this. So again, it just comes down to our attitude, our perspective, and how humble we are. The power of God manifests itself in all things, from the smallest to the greatest. He does not hide his light, but rather disperse it in constant waves to every corner of the universe, to such an extent that only those who are blind do not see. God does not wish their eyes to be opened by force, seeing that they desire them to keep to, they desire to keep them shut. Their time will come, but first it is necessary that they feel the anguish of darkness and so recognize it it is God and not mere a chance that hurt their pride. In order to overcome this incredulity, God uses the most convenient means according to each individual. It is not their incredulity that prescribes what is being done, nor is it up to them to say, if you want to convince me, then you must do this or that on a certain occasion, because this is what would persuade me. So here again, it's saying God is not hiding his light, right? Is not hiding any of his um, secrets, quote unquote, right? This heaven, this um, this idea of heaven, and um, all these things. God's not hiding that, but God's also not going to force us to open our eyes when we're choosing to shut them really tight, right? Um, if we open our eyes, it's there. It's there for us to to learn, to know, um, to experience. But if we're going to be stubborn and keep our eyes very shut, no one's going to come and try and convince us of that, right? God's not going to come knocking on our door and say, oh, you individually, let me explain to you all these things um, so you understand, so you believe this. And it's almost like who you're, that person is clearly not humble if they're thinking, oh, yeah, someone better come and try and convince me. Like, I'm too important. Like, you have to do all these things to convince me, right? God's not playing those kinds of games. So all these teachings are out there, but... God's not going to force you to open your eyes. But eventually we know you're going to keep reincarnating until you understand that you're going to have to open your eyes. But God's not going to force you to do that, right? You're going to have to be able to do that on your own time. Therefore, those who are unbelievers should not be surprised if neither God nor the spirits who execute his wishes do not submit to these demands. Instead, they should ask themselves what they would say if the lowest of their servants tried to oppose upon them in whatever form. 
God imposes the condition and does not accept those who wish to impose conditions on him. He listens kindly to those who direct themselves to him with humility and not those who judge themselves greater than he. So they're saying people who are in this power that they think they're superior on earth, God doesn't accept it. Think about those people who are superior. Would they accept something that one of their servants is telling them? Probably not. So the same thing, why would God accept these changes that this one selfish person is trying to impose on God, right? That doesn't that doesn't even make sense. So again, this is showing that extreme case, but this isn't a lot of people. And so we need to keep an open mind that we also are not going to open people's eyes, right? We're not going to force people's eyes open. The best we can do is open our eyes, follow this good path, stay humble, stay on the good path, and maybe we'll inspire others to open their eyes too. But we can't force people or convince people to open their eyes to this light of God. It is often asked if God could not touch these people personally by means of clear evident manifestation, before which even the most obstinate unbeliever would be convinced. Beyond all doubt, he could. But in this case, what merit would be gained? And more importantly, what use would it be? Do we not see people every day who do not bow down even before such evidence, and who say, Even if I saw, I would not believe, because I know it is impossible? If they deny truth in such a manner, it is because their spirits have not yet reached sufficient maturity to enable their to enable themselves to understand, or their hearts to feel it. Pride is the cataract that covers their vision. What good does it do to show a light to one who is blind? Rather, it is first necessary to cure the cause of the ill. This is why, as a skillful doctor, he first of all punishes their pride. He will never abandon any of his children, since sooner or later their eyes will be opened. But he wishes this to happen on their own free will. He defend, then defended by the torments and incredulity, they will throw themselves into his arms of their own accords, begging to be forgiven just as the prodigal son. So, again, here it's saying, yeah, God could, if God wanted to, God could do something that impacted a person, that made them change, that made them believe. But what's the point of that, right? He could, but the people need to come to those terms on their own, right? It's our free will to believe in whatever we want. God's not going to go to each person individually because that's like passing a, a test right that we didn't even study for or practice for or anything right so we we're going through the steps of life and we have our own choices we have our own free will to make our own decisions and if we choose to follow god then great we're we're getting ahead right we're following this path of good and hopefully that's um helping us to change our ways so we don't make as many mistakes we don't have to go through as many trials um but in the other hand, if we're going to close our eyes, then God's not going to come and force us and shake us awake, right? God will be there for us when we're ready to open our eyes, but God's not going to personally come and tell us we have to believe if we're not ready, right? Some people are not ready at a certain time, which is also why as individuals, if God isn't going to convince these people, then we also don't ha- are in, in any place to try and convince these people of spiritism or of what we believe in. So when someone has different beliefs, the best thing we can do is um, listen to them, hear them out. We can say our thought and be like, oh, I believe in this, but we're not trying to force it on them, right? We're not trying to impose on them what they should believe in because it might not be their time to, to accept that. But maybe one day they think, oh yeah, actually that makes sense. And then they come up to you and then they say, yeah, those things you were saying, I actually, um, really like the way you were explaining it can you tell me more and at that point it's their time right they're opening their eyes to that so then fill them in but we're not here to convince anyone else everyone has to open their eyes and for ourselves sometimes we close our eyes to things we need to just remember to keep them open and again just being humble and following that path of good 
So this is a good place to leave off, and next week we'll start um, in the next section, which is instructions from the spirits. But before we leave off today, I'd like to read our message from the Daily Book of Positive Quotations for today's date, October 8th. This one's titled, Growth. Happiness is neither virtue nor pleasure, nor this thing nor that, but simple growth. We are happy when we are growing. Only humans grow in a way that means something more than adding to our dimensions. When we say we've grown, we mean we've had experiences, good and bad, we've learned lessons, painful and easy, and we've opened ourselves to new things. Growth isn't always easy. We have psychological growth pains at many times during our lives, but if we are not growing, we cannot be truly happy. I hope to grow in some way every day of my life. And it's interesting to see here in even this um, non-spiritist book of quotations, it says, right, we've opened ourselves to new things. And again, that has to go with we have to open our eyes, right? Or each person has their own option, right, to open their eyes, to open themselves up. Um, And we can't force that on one another, but we hope that everyone can do that. If at all you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to email me at cardiacradioforteens at gmail.com and I'll get back to you right away. I'm Bia and this has been Cardiac Radio for Teens. Thank you all for listening. This has been Cardiac Radio for Teens. Thank you all for listening.